Let's talk about uh, globalisation and whether the phenomenon is over. Uh, is globalisation over is the title of a new book by Cambridge University lecturer Jeremy Green. In a year dominated by the trade war, Brexit and a climate crisis, questions have, been, uh, uh, have arisen over the fate of an interconnected world. So are we headed towards more fragmented future? Let's discuss with Jeremy Green, who joins us now on set here in London. Uh, Jeremy, really good to, to speak to you uh, about your new book. And I'll, I'll start at the end, if I might, around climate climate change because one of the questions that you one of the, the, the things that you bring up in your book is whether globalization is over is partly to do with whether we manage to find a model of globalization that works with the climate challenges that we face what's at stake well climate change is shaping up to be the definitive challenge of the 21st century so any future for globalization has to be also a future in which we can reconcile economic growth um, an interconnected world economy with a sustainable uh, environment so the, the ramifications of climate change for uh, globalization are extremely important. In the short term, it may enable a boost for growth. So if we think about the uh, enormous requirement for green infrastructure investment to decarbonize our economies, um, and if we were to loosen fiscal policy in order to achieve this, then that could be a big uh, boost to global growth. But in the longer term, I think climate change raises some really uh, important questions and doubts about the prospects of growth. Um, unless we're able to decouple economic growth from in intensified economic uh, and environmental pressures, then uh, there may be the question of whether or not we can actually sustain growth going into the future or whether or not actually growth itself is something we might need to aspire to less as okay. a goal. And does it help to look back to inform that future uh, and the, the, the future decision making that you described there? Because I know in your book you look back to other eras of globalisation, where the phenomenon came from, who were the winners and the losers and how globalisation has changed over time. So it, it, does it help us to look back to other periods of globalisation to, to tell us where this might head? So setting globalization in historical context, which is what I do in the book, is really helpful for identifying what's specific to the current crisis and then which aspects of this crisis bear some resemblance to previous uh, periods of disruption in the global economy. So it can be useful for positioning exactly where we're at at the moment in terms of trade, um, trade politics, the situation around global investment, uh, rising nationalism. But I think climate change is actually a very singular problem and I think that what setting this globalization crisis in historical context does is reveal starkly how unique that problem is mm. and so history is not really any guide to dealing with climate change we're going to have to rethink and be quite imaginative about how we repurpose our economies and our politics to meet the challenges of climate change yes and, and I mean and your book talks about uh, the legacy of the financial crisis and as much as it's we want to look forward to, the, to, to climate challenges it's very evident reading it how much we're still dealing with the aftermath of financial crises that have gone past. I mean, do you expect that globalization survives the challenge of the, of the great financial crisis? Because that's still maybe an open question. I think we're very much living through a period that is shaped by the legacy of the global financial crisis. Uh, the crisis severely undermined confidence in the globalization project. It led to stagnating growth, um, declining wages, and the rise of populist nationalism in many countries. But I don't think it spells the end for globalization. Globalization is much deeper and more resilient than it has been. Uh, and I think that buys us some time to reset globalization on a stable footing. But if we don't deal with the climate question, then I think globalization's future does look bleak. And, and it seems that many in the West, uh, that there seems to be a bit of a crisis of confidence with the rise of China, where the West heads here and how the West coexists against a, a rising China with a, with a bigger global footprint. Is, are there, is there room for two models of globalization? One that's sort of linked to democracy and, and, and the like and, and, and a Chinese model. Is there room for the two to exist uh, next to each other? Well, I think that the rise of China has definitely provoked uh, quite a lot of anxiety in the West. It was uh, states like the US and Britain that were the primary architects of the globalization project after the Second World War. And I think the rapid rise of China, its ability to be more of a rule maker rather than simply a rule taker, has shaken Western confidence that the West would be the primary beneficiaries of uh, globalization. I think we're already seeing the coexistence of different models of capitalism. Uh, and if we look at the trade dispute between the US and China, that's very much about American capitalism against China's state-led post-communist form of capitalism. And a lot of the discontent from the US about uh, China's trade performance is that the, the kind of state-led model of capitalism gives China unfair advantages 
in the in the global economy. And, and are either of those better or worse than the other at sheltering their populations from the effects of globalization? Because that seems to be one of the still unanswered questions. You know, globalization might be good for an economy as a whole, but it doesn't necessarily benefit every community within that. And making sure people are not overly damaged and then leading to, to, to increased uh, demand for sort of populist narrative. Are, are different models of globalization able to address that differently? I think states certainly have flexibility to put in place different domestic economic models that can help uh, mediate the pressures of globalization. That depends, of course, on how powerful the country is. So the US and China, both extremely powerful states, they therefore have more capacity to try and shape the rules of globalization and to use their own financial muscle domestically to achieve certain uh, policy goals. Uh, and I think one of the problems with globalization in recent decades is that it didn't allow enough flexibility at the domestic level to try and bend globalization to the interests of citizens and general economic well-being. Because you, you say those two may be in the driving seat, but there were plenty of communities who would say that they missed out on the benefits, certainly in the United States. Absolutely. I think uh, both of these economies have experienced rapid growth under globalization, of course, China more so in, in recent years, but both have also seen spectacular increases in inequality. So although China has been able to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in recent decades, it's also seen spe spectacular increases in inequality. And the same applies to the United States. And of course, the politics of inequality in, in the US has become much more prominent post Occupy Wall Street.